Hello everyone and welcome to uh, our tutorial number six. And today uh, we have uh, a topic of uh, TR398, which is the first performance standard developed by the Broadband Forum for Wi-Fi. So I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, we again have with us our CTO, Lee Chinitz. Uh, who has been in the data communications industry since the early 90s with all the key companies, uh, one of the pioneers in Wi-Fi, Proxim, uh, and uh, Cisco and CASA systems, other technologies, uh, including UMTS, CDMA, femtocells, small cells. Lee has done a lot of work in the standards organizations and, and with FCC. Uh, he's most recently been contributor to the Wi-Fi Alliance, IEEE, TIA, and I ITU. Uh, we have with us today to run some tests for us, Prachi Samkumar, uh, who's our systems engineer. Prachi uh, works with our customers in the Bay Area in California, and she's our expert on the Wi-Fi Alliance testbed, and now she's quickly becoming an expert on the TR398 testbed. So we'll have to amend your bio, Prachi. Uh, and so um, we are holding these sessions live three times during the day in, in order to reach all the time zones and so we can interact with our audience, with you folks live and, and uh, get your questions live. So you're welcome to post notes and questions in either in the chats or in Q&A or raise your hand. If you need help with Zoom, uh, let us know and, and we'll help you out. And with that, we're gonna get started. We'll uh, let Lee take, uh, take the floor. Um, hi everybody. And again, thank you all for joining the now sixth in our, um, in our series. I guess everybody has uh, watched everything on Netflix at this point, and so we're happy to be able to provide you some other content to uh, uh, entertain yourself while, uh, while we're all staying at home and, uh, and being safe. Um, so I noticed from that poll that maybe a quarter of the people seemed were not familiar with um, Broadband Forum and TR-398. So, let me give a little introduction to the, the whole idea here. Um, and I'm gonna start by uh, discussing the difference between an interoperability test and a performance test. Um, in the, really in the communications industry in general and probably many industries, um, you know, interoperability is the, really the first thing that you really need to worry about. And, and we, we hear a lot about interoperability testing. Um, you know, it's very important, especially when you are looking at uh, standards like, you know, Wi-Fi and, and others, um, where you'll have multiple vendors all creating products with the intention that those products can communicate with each other. So the important first question to ask is, can my device that I made and I believe is in conformance with the standard, talk to your device that you made, um, which you think is in conformance with the standard, and can they, can they work together and can they make something happen? That's kind of the first level uh, that we get to. Um, a performance test is a little bit different. A performance test says, all right, once I know that the devices can communicate with each other, now I'm interested in knowing how well that works. Is it, you know, just for sort of basic communication or is it, you know, really advanced and, and able to provide, uh, you know, a really an excellent service. So that's the difference between, in, in, uh, between uh, interoperability and performance. In the Wi-Fi industry specifically, um, you know, interoperability is the thing that we kind of all talk about most of the time, right? We talk a lot about the Wi-Fi Alliance. The Wi-Fi Alliance has done uh, amazing work, really, in um, making Wi-Fi the standard that it is. Um, this is a little graphic from them talking about everything that's happened since around 1999 when the first, um, you know, 802.11b uh, spec hit the market. Um, and, uh, you know, since then, uh, they have been driving the market in terms of 
um, not only marketing, but really just making sure that with each advance in technology, um, the products continue to be interoperable. And, you know, it's had amazing success. I, I don't think it's necessary to, uh, to really belabor this point. Um, I always like to point this one out and just in case anyone didn't see it. I just think this is a, a great uh, survey came out of, uh, out of the UK um, that said that Wi-Fi was the best invention of the last 25 years, um, beating things like the iPhone and Google. And, you know, I, I think we all know why, why that is. I mean, it's penetrated everybody's life and interoperability is a huge reason for that. Interoperability though, uh, has one potential downside. If you want to think of it as a downside, which is that, um, a person then looking at purchasing a device now has many options because uh, the interoperability regime is, is so well done that many different companies can build products that will interoperate and, and a person needing to decide now uh, what product to use for any specific application um, will be confronted by, by many options. So you have a lot of products to choose from um, you know, no matter what it, what part of the system you're looking at, right? Whether you're looking at access points, gateways, extenders, uh, uh, station devices, client devices like phones or laptops, whatever it is, they all work together. Now you need to decide which one to use. So that's where performance testing comes in. Um, at Octoscope, by the way, we actually, uh, we support both of those activities, uh, not only just in terms of our kind of support for them, because we think they're important, but we support them from a product point of view. Um, we have uh, a test bed uh, that is specifically aimed at uh, helping companies uh, to look at their products in terms of the Wi-Fi Alliance certification process. We call it a pre-certification test bed. It's shown there on the right. Um, I think we've probably spoken about it in some other um, of our tutorials, um, but anybody interested in, in hearing more about it um, is welcome to contact us. I'm happy to talk about it. It's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk today about our support, again, both from an activity point of view and a product point of view uh, in terms of performance testing. Uh, and uh, specifically, we'll be talking about the, uh, the standardized performance uh, test plan known as TR398 from the Broadband Forum. And we'll, we'll discuss how we implement those tests in the, uh, in the system shown here on the, on the screen. You know, any of you who've attended some of our previous tutorials will know that we like to mix in um, not only me sort of talking about various things, but, and other people as well, obviously. And, uh, but we, we, also like to, um, we also like to mix in actual demos. We like to show you the, uh, the, the tests running and things like that. Um, for this seminar or tutorial, we've, we've uh, done it a little bit differently. We are gonna do that, um, but before I explain everything, we're actually gonna start a test. And the reason for that, and I'll describe why later, uh, is that, um, the, uh, the tests themselves are, are quite long. Um, and so um, what I wanna first do, and it's a little bit out of order, uh, and I'll describe more about the Broadband Forum later for those of you who aren't uh, aware of it and things like that. The first thing I wanna do is just give you all a sense of what this performance test plan looks like uh, coming out of the Broadband Forum. It's made up of 11 tests, 10 of which are mandatory and they're sort of highlighted in here broken into four different categories of general performance, coverage, multiple station performance, and then overall stability of the product. Um, you can see the individual tests here. I'm not going to uh, talk about each one individually. Um, anyone who wants the slides uh, has them. You can also look at the, at the test plan itself. Uh, it's, it's freely available. Um, but again, basically performance looks at things like throughput and uh, you know, the number of, of devices that can be supported. Coverage looks at things like rate versus range and rate versus range with orientation. Multiple stations looks at things like, as the name implies, how an access point is able to handle multiple stations simultaneously and stability again, looks at things like if you wanna run 
uh, a test for quite a long period of time, for example, uh, is the is the device able to uh, to handle that that type of uh, that type of test? So this is these are the tests uh, that 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 make up TR three ninety eight. Um, as I just said, these tests can take a really long time to run, um, and and I will describe for you a little bit why that is. But just in general, it's because the tests themselves uh, are made up of many different subtests. A very simple example would be that a test might be made up of a, a test in the 2.4 gigahertz band and a test in the 5 gigahertz band and that same test in the uplink direction and the downlink direction. So a, a single test may be made up of, of four what I call subtests, but it is um, um, that's actually one of the simpler ones. There are much more complicated tests that, that may have not four, but more like eight or 12 or 16 subtests. So these tests can take a very long time to run and we just, there's just no way to do it, an entire test within the, the time frame of this. Um, and we don't really wanna bore you by kind of showing you this. So what we're gonna do is we wanna start a test at the beginning so you can kind of see how it starts. You can get a, a sense of, of what it all looks like when we're running it. Then I'm gonna describe it in more detail and then we'll come back later and look at the results. Um, we, we picked one of the multiple station performance tests because it actually highlights a lot of the key attributes of the system that we're using. Um, this test requires station devices to be at different distances. I have distances in quotes <clears throat> because it's a, the way we do our, uh, our testing, obviously, is in our isolated chambers. So it's really uh, attenuation or path loss between the devices and the access point. And it also requires many stations. Um, and uh, we, we use our virtual station capability to do that. So let me, uh, uh, I'll get into that in more detail. Like I said, what we want to do here is, is give you a sense. And then we actually want to show you the test running. We'll start it. We'll come back to it later. So let me give you a quick uh, visual description of what this multiple station performance test is looking at. What it's looking at is the ability of an access point <clears throat> to support, as per the name, multiple stations. So we start off doing the test with uh, three stations uh, at a fairly close distance to the access point. And uh, we run traffic to all three of them. And there's an expectation that there will be some aggregate throughput on this link. So the sum of the, of the traffic going to each station will be something, and that should be higher than some limit. We then add three more stations, but those stations are actually further away from the access point. And because they're further away, they're <coughs> likely to have um, a lower data rate. <clears throat> and then we look again at the aggregate traffic uh, between the access point and all six of these stations. And because we have some stations at at lower data rate, we would expect the aggregate throughput to be somewhat lower, but there's some you know, uh, defined threshold by the, by the group. And then the last part of the test is we add three more stations even further away. Again, these are likely to have even lower uh, uh, data rates and therefore the aggregate traffic to all nine of these would even be lower, but it's expected to be at some level. So that's the test we're gonna run. And I'm gonna hand this off to Prachi now to start us off so you can see the test running. We'll come back. I will describe more about TR398, more about the tests and things like that. But um, this way you can get a, uh, a, first, uh, a first look at, at how, how it looks when we run these tests. <clears throat> Thank you, Lee. Um, so yeah. So what I've done is I've already started the test uh, on the command line here, if you can see. So right now it's running um, a 2.4 gigahertz short distance test uh, in downlink direction. So on, on the UI, um, you can see that we have um, nine stations. Um, and if you see here, uh, we have enabled the virtual station capability of our PAL-6. So each of the PAL-6 uh, is uh, configured as three virtual stations. So right now, uh, you can see the plot of um, 2.4 gigahertz um, downlink short distance. And after that, what will happen is uh, we will enable additional three virtual stations um, in the medium, um, medium range uh, uh, with additional attenuation. 
and you can see the run on the UI. So let's it's showing that it associates and as soon as it starts running, I, I could show you the different statistics on the UI. So many of you might, might be familiar with the UI, but um, I'll just go through it again. So the advantage of using PAL6 uh, as our endpoint is we get to see the other underlying matrix apart from the throughput. So you could see that uh, we have the throughput here. We have throughput from each individual um, virtual stations and uh, the black one is the aggregate. Um, you can see the RSSI, you can see the data control RSSI and data RSSI per chain. And we can see that um, it has refreshed the page and we are running a short and a medium distance um, throughput now. So apart from the RSSI, we can see the data rates, uh, MCS, uh, the number of streams and bandwidth. So yeah, this is uh, one part of the entire TR398 test. Uh, and uh, after this, we will run a short, medium, and long distance test, and we will continue to five gigahertz tests. So um, I think we will come back to the results uh, after the run is completed, um, and Lee can go over the results with you guys. So Lee, um, can you, um, should I stop sharing and you can take over the screen? Uh, no, let's hold on just a second. So yeah, so everybody, uh, as, uh, as you just saw here, you know, this test, um, is running automatically. We're using our, our automated framework. We've created, um, you know, all the automation for all these tests. And you can see what, what, what's nice about this is that although the test is running automatically and you don't actually have to do anything, um, you can see that the test itself um, does get created and, and, and is made visible in the UI. So you can watch it but you're not actually required to do anything. You don't have to watch it either. Um, I see that there's a question, and before we leave the screen, let's see if the question is related to the screen. Does, uh, do we want... It's not, uh, so we okay. can finish on the screen. Okay. I will take a screen back then. I, I, would, uh, I would also add all these tests are saved in our database in MongoDB as you run them, as well as exported results. Now, the question is from Isaac. Um, and he's asking, what incremental distancing are you using for for the stay the stays? I don't remember the actual numbers off the top of my head, but the nice thing about TR three ninety eight, and I will uh, I'll get into this a little bit more, is that you know the tests themselves are are well defined. So um, so it's it's something like uh, it's something like this the um, uh, the basic configuration for TR398 test has the station device being, and I, I will say in air quotes, two meters away from the access point. Um, it's, it's, again, specifically defined in the, in the spec that it's either two meters physical distance or uh, the equivalent of two meters attenuation uh, in free space. So, um, and, and that's because we use multiple chamber uh, environment, we actually have, uh, we, we use the, the two meters free space um, definition. And then the, these incremental distances are just uh, defined in the spec. So I think that the short distance is two meters plus 10 dB, and then the medium one is something like two meters plus 30 dB, and then the long one is two meters plus 40 dB. It's something like that, but that's kind of how the spec is written. It, it, it sets up the tests and then tells you what you need to do. Okay, we have one more question from Michaela. Uh, if we do not use the PAL as an end device, then what information of the GUI uh, we can get? I guess there are two parts to that in, in, the, in this context, in this test, and, and in general when we run the tests, right? Right. Um, I'll, I'll answer a little bit, Fanny. You probably also want to jump in. So. Um, there are, um, so first of all, you can run the tests. Uh, I think what we're describing here is, is um, in addition to TR398 itself, uh, we're also talking a little bit about our implementation of TR398. Our, our test scripts certainly assume that the PAL is the endpoint, but let, let, me, let me say, okay, assuming that you don't have the PAL, um, what could you use? A lot of TR398 uh, looks at throughput as, as you just saw um, and you'll see later. So, um, you know, if you have, um, 
um, the, you, for example, you can put our, our traffic generation tool on your endpoint. We have our traffic generation tool we call Multiperf. Um, it supports a, a lot of different uh, traffic generation capabilities and it has uh, the availability on a number of different platforms, um, uh, Linux, Android, that sort of thing. So if you use that, uh, you would be able to get um, a lot of information that is necessary for tr 38 like throughput, uh, and and dropped packets and things like that. Um, you would not be able to see that second level of information that Prachi was pointing out, things like uh, RSSI, um, you know, streams, bandwidth, uh, et cetera, at least not directly, but I don't know, Fanny, if you wanna talk a little bit about sniffing sure. here? Yeah, or? yeah, I guess with the devices, yes, we do wanna mention our synchro sniffing technology and that we can have uh, 16 sniffing probes in the platform comfortably with one of our test bed uh, PAL boxes. You can put a sniffer dedicated on each real device and then you could report all of those stats that Lee just mentioned, MCS number of streams, bandwidth, et cetera, because a sniffer will report it and we, we need to position its probe so that it hears the device. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. We do try to accommodate not just the PALs, but provide as much information as we can on the devices that are put in the test bed. Okay, we have another question. Um, it says, what, um, what kind of devices, this is from Florian, what kind of devices does your PAL-6 simulate? Three Wi-Fi 6 devices or three Wi-Fi 5 devices or mixed setups? So yeah, the, the, uh, the virtual station capability lets you, um, well, actually, before I do virtual stations, let me just talk in general. So the, 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 the PAL-6 uh, is a, uh, it's a chipset-based uh, test endpoint like all of our PALs. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a real Wi-Fi device, meaning it's backward compatible to, as we discussed before, with interoperability to all the other, you know, Wi-Fi things. So it can operate as a Wi-Fi 6 device, a Wi-Fi 5 device, um, and, and legacy devices, which, by the way, we'll actually show you later in the, in the tutorial. Um, when you set it up as, as virtual stations, um, you actually have control over the virtual stations as well. So the virtual stations can be also a mix of devices. Right. Okay. Now, another question from Mattia. The main issue of working according to the TR398, in my opinion, is the possibility to procure a stay where is possible to set the test parameters, MCS index, and assess NGI. How can it work outside the whole Octoscope solution? How can it work outside the Octoscope solution? Um, well, you know, so, t you know, we should probably go a little bit into TR398, which was the, which is the next plan here, but let me um, try and address that. You know, TR398 is focused on, on access point testing, uh, and, and it does, uh, in fact, require that you be able to, you know, set some devices into legacy mode or things like that. It does not specify how that has to be done. We happen to think we have an excellent test bed for implementing it for a number of reasons, which we'll also discuss some more of here, um, because the PAL is so flexible. Um, but, you know, the, the test plan itself does not describe how you should do these things, right? All it says, for example, is that you need to have, uh, for example, three devices that are close and then another three devices that are legacy devices. And how you do that is kind of up to you in terms of creating a test. What we've tried to do is to make it very easy. And again, the PAL, the, our PAL devices make it easy because we have that control. I, I don't know if that's a good enough answer, but um, I, I, maybe I'm agreeing with the, with the yeah. sense of your question, which is that it, it's hard to do and we've tried to make it easy. Okay, another, we have a couple of questions in the queue. Uh, from David Herman, uh, how does the setup uh, exact look like? Do you use three PAL-6 with different attenuation to each PAL-6 and simulate three Vista, or how do you get different attenuations if you use nine stations and one yep. PAL-6? 
I guess gotcha. we have an, uh, an answer in the slides. That we we do, we do. You know, I, I, I tried to lay the groundwork before to say it's a little bit out of order because we wanted to start a test for you and, and show you the test running all the way through, but we, we got a little out of order. So before I do any more questions, why don't I do a couple more slides and see if we take out some of those questions. Cause I, I think maybe we're getting into like, well, what did we do? So let me, let me, yeah, is that okay, Fanny? On. I just want to respond very quickly to Mikhail and then we'll leave okay. their other questions for later. So okay. Mikhail is asking about the sniffer probes. We had a whole session where we explained our sniffer sniffer, Mikhail. We'll be happy to follow up with you on how exactly that works. Uh, if you'd like to stay later or just uh, we can, contact you after the show all right okay so just now now we're kind of going to start on some of the more basics here for anybody who's not aware of the broadband forum um, it is an industry forum it's actually very well known i think it started uh as the dsl forum quite a long time ago um it's now known as the broadband forum um it's most i don't know if it's most well known it is certainly very well known for um a specification called uh, uh tr69 TR-69 is uh, used to uh, control uh, CPE devices. So things like DSL modems or you know, other uh, home CPE devices. Um, it is a, uh, again, it's a, it's a, it's a well-known industry group made up of operators, vendors, chipset manufacturers, blah, blah, you know, everybody, everybody's there. But um, it does have a bit of a focus on operators in the sense that, you know, the way the group works is it's intended to allow operators to describe what they need uh, and, and then create tests and other things that will, uh, that will address the needs of operators. Um, so from a Wi-Fi point of view, uh, this TR-398, so this 398 group was created um, because the, the Wi-Fi, the, the, you know, uh, the operators, operators who, who are uh, members and, uh, you know, who, who have many different types, many different types of operators, some cable operators or, or wireless operators, but all of them who are deploying Wi-Fi um, wanted some kind of performance test that they could use. So this is the work's been going on for quite a while. Um, in in uh, broadband forum terminology, they don't use uh, release one, release two, or version one, version two. They they call things issue, issue one, issue two. So issue one was actually released by the broadband forum TR398 group in February of last year. So it's been around a while. Uh, and what's happening right now, in fact, literally right now, uh, the last week and this week was the, the most recent broadband forum meeting. I think today is the closing plenary. Um, and the group is working on issue two. And I'll talk a little bit about what's in issue two later or likely to be an issue two. And the goal is to finish issue two by the Q3 meeting. So later this year, we hope to have issue two of TR398. Um, as I mentioned, it, you know, this was all sort of based on operators trying to get a performance test for Wi-Fi. So the focus is on AP devices. Again, there is no part of the test that looks at station devices. Stations are used to do testing, but they're not part of the, they're not part of what's being tested. The device under test is always an access point or residential gateway or something like that. Um, because it is again, focused on operators and their deployment needs. This isn't the kind of thing like, you know, the Wi-Fi Alliance always looking at the very latest technology and trying to do interoperability. This is looking at what is actually deployed in the world and seeing if we could come up with a reasonable uh, test plan to look at that. So in issue one, uh, the 2.4 gigahertz tests only look at 802.11n uh, uh, technology and in five gigahertz at 11 AC always two streams because that's the primary deployment out there most station devices are two streams so it doesn't again try to push the envelope on multiple streams or uh, anything like that it's 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 looking at what's really deployed and the the big uh, thing that differentiates TR398 from other test plans uh, that that may be available is that it's the first that we know of certainly where the industry agreed on absolute 
uh, pass fail requirements that, that could be used. So to get to a question that was asked, um, here's how we implement this. The stack max uh, is a, um, one of the larger stacks uh, that's part of our, um, our uh, standardized uh, stack portfolio. And uh, we have been using it for all of the tutorials that we've done. We've been showing how it's used in, uh, uh, in various other kinds of tests. And today we're showing how it's used for TR398. Um, but this is what it looks like. Um, and uh, it's made up of essentially, you know, five chambers. You can see one, two, three, four, five, uh, big one on top. And then um, uh, the, those chambers are all connected up in various ways. When you look at this picture, you can see like these blue cables are our RF cables. You can see things on the side, which are our, you know, attenuators or PALs or things like that. Um, and so it's a little easier to understand this, this picture if we look at it as a logical diagram. Um, but before I show it to you as a logical diagram, let me give you a quick, very, very quick tutorial on how we draw those logical diagrams. So those blue RF cables uh, that I showed you that look like this um, are usually shown uh, in groups of four. So a single blue line will be four of these RF cables. Uh, we have these antennas in all the boxes. You can see our test antennas. If you look around, you'll see them everywhere. Um, they look like this. There's multiple different kinds of antennas that we have. Um, and when we show them in our diagrams, we tend to show them also in groups of four. So a single uh, antenna like this one here is a, is a group of four of these things. Um, attenuation is done using our attenuators, which again, we tend to show in groups of four. A single one of our attenuators, you can see it, has four uh, inputs and outputs. So it's able to simultaneously attenuate four uh, RF lines. Uh, this is the symbol that you will see when we're talking about one of these, what we call quad attends. And then finally, uh, the PAL-6. Uh, is our test endpoint. It's, I, I've talked about it a few times already. It's our chipset-based uh, Wi-Fi 6 test endpoint. Um, we'll call it the PAL-6, and the symbol that you'll see in the diagram I'm about to show is the one over here that says PAL-6 in the middle of it, but that's, that's what we're talking about. So if you look at the, that, that stack uh, that I just showed you uh, in real life, shown again here, um, and look at it logically, um, I'm showing it now uh, and highlighting in red what elements are used for TR398. So to get to the, to the question that was asked, this box up here with the turntable in it is where we put the device under test. We then use a set of three PALs, one over here, one over here, one over here uh, as test endpoints. We don't need all three PALs in all of the tests, um, but we do need up to three PALs, and so we have them all available. You can see that via the red lines, um, this device under test is connected to each of the three PALs, one, two, three, through a different attenuators. Uh, in this case, it's through our multipath emulator, which was the topic of, I don't know, maybe our first tutorial, um, I think. Um, so if anyone's interested, you can take a look at that one but it also just provides uh, attenuation functionality. So you can think of it in this case as an attenuator and then another and another uh, connecting the device under test to the three PAL sixes. So the test that we just did, uh, we just started running that you saw was this multi-station performance uh, test. And the reason I chose that one to run is because it does use so much of the test bed. It uses all of the PALs and it uses the virtual station capability. So the way that's implemented in this test is, you know, we have our, our device under test up here uh, in the big chamber sitting on the turntable. It's connected to a PAL down here through the MPE, which is actually this thing here. Um, again, and, and that's our short distance test. Then when we have to add the medium distance, we use another PAL over here through a different attenuator. Again, three virtual stations for a total of six. And then finally, uh, a long distance uh, test using another PAL down here through a different attenuator, three more virtual stations for a total of nine. So I take a little pause here because this question was asked. Does that answer it?
It looks like no more questions, so I'm assuming we answered it. Uh, just a, a clarification. So you see we have uh, these modules on the bottom of the two small boxes on the left there below. Uh, that they make up a, what we call a smart box. So the PAL-6, Lee showed a photo. It can be outside, independent, fully isolated module. And it can also be built in to the chamber. So you don't need, it, it um, makes the whole test bed more highly integrated, smaller, cheaper, and easier to work with. Uh, so that's, that's what those modules are down there. I'm seeing questions, Fanny. Do we want to take them now? Yep, let's uh, do the questions. Uh, yes, your question has been answered. So there's uh, another question from Mattia. Inside the octoboxes, how are the near field effects handled given the physical short distances between antennas and duct? Um, so near field effects uh, are, uh, you know, they're, they're fact uh, that we are usually in the near field of these testing, but there's nothing uh, that we need to do to you know, handle them as the question is asked. What we're what we're doing is is coupling energy from the device under test to the uh, to the to the other endpoints, and uh, that works as well in the near field as it does in the far field. Um, one of the I, I'm I'm reading into the question. Maybe you know, like, can we support, for example, MIMO uh, in in a in a smaller chamber like this? And the answer to that question is definitely yes. Uh, we have MIMO uh, results all the time. We also have a theoretical analysis of the test bed talking about MIMO in under near field conditions. So we, we have no uh, issues, you know, being able to do the kind of performance testing that we're doing, even though we're in the near field of the of the devices. Right. And then another question, in what kind is a turntable required for the TR398 test? Uh, okay. Um, that's an interesting question. Let me just quickly flip back here. There is a spatial consistency test uh, that uses it. So that one, you know, walks through the, uh, the spins the device under test, I think, in 30 degree steps. And there is, if I remember correctly, uh, I think that the optional test, the receive sensitivity optional test may use the turntable. I believe. I would have to go back and look. I think so, though. Certainly the spatial consistency one uses it. Okay, we're clear. Okay, so what I wanted to do now is uh, go back to the running test and take a look at the output, kind of show you what that looks like. Uh, and um, uh, then discuss a little bit more about, um, you know, how we, how we can analyze the data. Um, so let me see something. Okay, so um, am I am I showing the uh, the test bed now? Yes. Okay, great. So so the the test has has completed, um, and just to give you a sense of you know what happens, uh, and you will see us start a test in a minute. But it's very very simple to start a test. Once the, uh, once the test has, uh, has been started, you don't have to do anything and the results will show up here. So um, we have uh, a log file for the run that we did uh, and then we did this multiple station performance test. And what you can see here is that we've automatically saved in uh, CSV format um, our, our test bed, as Fanny mentioned before, when we run these tests, the, the test uh, results are automatically saved in our uh, database. Um, we can also export the, um, the results and we can export them in CSV format among other things. And uh, what you can see here, if you just sort of look, is, um, the, uh, is the various, are the various uh, um, uh, CSV exports for those runs. So remember I mentioned that this is a, a short distance test. It has, it has, uh, devices at short distance, and then it adds in devices at medium distance, and then it adds in further devices at long distance. Um, and you can see that in the downlink direction, you can see it in the uplink direction, you can see it at 2.4, you can see it at 5. That's why I was saying before, uh, tier 398 tests themselves can be quite complicated. You know, a quote-unquote test may include many, many subtests. 
we do that all automatically. We also analyze the results um, automatically. So you can see uh, here uh, in this um, uh, log file that we uh, analyze the results and you can see that the short distance test passed. It's telling you the actual measured throughput and telling you what the uh, TR398 threshold is. So it, it tells you about all the passing. Uh, it actually tells you at the end that all the tests passed in this case. So the test is complete, all the tests passed. You have all of the data if you want it. Um, and um, we, uh, uh, you know, we analyze it that way. We're also uh, adding in the ability to, um, let me show you, uh, well, I can do it here actually. I guess I'll do it here. Uh, and I see that there's a hand raised and I will, um, I will address it in just a second. Yeah, Lee, so can we, uh, do, can we customize these triggers? Like you said, uh, uh, expected output is this and, and, uh, uh, and the, what we get is this. So we can customize this somewhere? Well, uh, TR398 calls out the, 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 uh, the expected results, right? So, uh, I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry. It calls out the thresholds. So if you want to do TR398 test as written, uh, you would use uh, those. We haven't built into the, uh, the scripts themselves the ability to use other thresholds. Um, so, but that's something that, you know, we could sort of talk about it offline. But, but right now what we're showing is the implementation of TR398 as published by the Broadband Forum. Okay, Lee, thanks. Sure. Uh, and and I just I'm showing you I'm showing a very quick example of the fact that um, we can uh, you know look at this data uh, in um, in a more sort of graphical format graphical tabular format and uh, this is uh, the kind of functionality we're actually adding to um, to our uh, test bed as well um, in addition to the log file results that I just showed you, you know, also the ability to look at this data and get more of a, for example, in this case, graphical view. You can see the short test, you know, with three pairs. Uh, you can see the throughput that was achieved. You can see the, uh, the throughput that was required. I think I've incorporated, picked in some, some different data, but it's fine. Um, so let me uh, let me go back. But we uh, anyway. Th this this is the kind of uh, of view that we're also looking at building. So here's an example of of what I was just showing. So you can see the throughputs, the throughput limits, the pass fail result, um, or you know in a more uh, graphical way, you know the short the short plus medium the short plus medium plus long uh, results along with the TR three ninety eight limits. Uh, as, as set. And, you know, the question about whether these can be configured is one that we could probably take a little bit offline. We haven't, we haven't done that yet. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, sorry, am I sharing the right thing? I am. I'm sharing, I'm sharing the slides again, right? Yes? Yeah. Okay. You are. Actually, we have another question. Would you like to take it now, Lee? Uh, sure, if it's relevant, yeah. Uh, besides the standard IPAR three settings, mode, duration, traffic, et cetera, the rest, windows, buffer size, et cetera, is left to the operating system of the test PC. Do you just leave the default values? Is it still a fair comparison? Uh, we, yeah, we, we use, um, we use the, the, uh, the parameters as configured, uh, you know, as kind of called out in the test plan. And, and that is true when we run, TR three ninety eight um, test, like for example, the maximum throughput test, we will we will set iperf to run you know maximum traffic, and if the test plan itself hasn't called out anything else, we do leave it as you say to uh, to whatever the the defaults would be. Is it fair, fair comparison? Um, I I think so. I mean, I guess it would be. I guess I'd have to have a conversation about why it might not be a fair comparison. Certainly if you are comparing devices A, B in the same test setup, uh, then the underlying, say, OS 
will be the same across both, right? So the only difference should be the performance of the device under test. If you're comparing them across systems, I guess I could maybe understand the, uh, the, the reason for the question. Um, and we can come back to that one if, if there's more on it. Let me, uh, let me I'll, I'll just uh, kind of forge ahead here, give, give people some understanding of what's going on in the uh, broadband forum tier 388 group. So I mentioned issue two focus for Q3 of this year. Um, here's what's going on. Uh, again, just a slight warning, uh, nothing is finalized yet. So what I'm telling you is what's currently being discussed. Um, until the spec is done, you, you can't, count on any of these, but um, here's the kind of things that are being discussed. One obvious one is 802.11ax. I mentioned before it's uh, the issue one looks at N and AC. <clears throat> Obviously Wi-Fi 6 is a very hot topic, so looking at uh, Wi-Fi 6 in both the 2.4 gigahertz band using 20 megahertz channels and the 5 gigahertz band using 80 megahertz channels is uh, essentially being added to each of the test cases, each of the existing test cases. An additional test case was created to do something that's a little bit special for TR398, which again, usually focuses on things that are really out there in the world, um, but wanted to look at the peak performance of 11AX. So it is looking at 160 megahertz two stream, which by the way, is gonna be out there in the world. We have a lot of customers that are very interested in testing that. So that one is not really um, an unusual test, um, but that's a, it's a standalone test. And then there are, this is the one that's a little bit more unusual. There's uh, some optional tests, at least being discussed right now, using four and even eight streams at 160 megahertz. Um, that's very unlikely, I think, to be seen out there in the world anytime soon, four stream devices, uh, or especially eight stream, but um, that's ongoing conversation. Um, I've said a few times that the TR-398 tests uh, look at the 2.4 gigahertz band, the five gigahertz band. They do those tests separately. Um, and uh, issue two is looking at adding dual band simultaneous traffic. Um, so two, four and five simultaneously. Uh, I've also mentioned that the tests will do upstream tests and downstream tests. Um, but again, issue one does them independently. Issue two is looking at adding simultaneous bidirectional tests. Um, and then maybe the most interesting uh, conversations going on right now uh, for issue two have to do with extending beyond the single AP model going to the multiple AP models. Um, again, I, I was describing before how a lot of this is driven by operators deploying Wi-Fi. Uh, the, you know, I think the primary uh, deployment model previously was put an access point somewhere centrally located in a home and try to uh, try to achieve whole home coverage. Um, now, of course, there are many, many um, uh, mesh and repeater products in the market. Uh, operators very interested in those, and so there are some uh, there are some test cases being created uh, around mesh and roaming. Um, one test case that's being proposed has to do with looking at the traffic as it flows from an access point through a repeater to the station. So instead of directly from the, uh, from the access point to the station, it will flow through some repeating or mesh device. And then uh, there's a roaming test that is being proposed that looks at moving a station from one access point to another and back and uh, creating a metric uh, that's trying to get at how long that roam takes by looking at uh, packets that are dropped during the roam event. The thing, the reason I think this is interesting is um, I, I had mentioned earlier, earlier on, uh, I think somebody had asked about, uh, you know, I don't know, the ease of creating these tests and how we do it with the PALs and things like that. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons that, you know, we do think we have a, a, a pretty uh, nice system for implementing TR398 tests um, is that a lot of these tests require like longer distances and things like that, which are very difficult to do in a, in a single chamber environment. Um, but TR398 does call out both single chamber and multiple chamber environments. For this particular test, for this roaming test, at least right now, 
the group is anticipating that these would only be able to be done in a multiple chamber environment um, because it's very, very complicated or difficult or possibly impossible to have a station actually move from one device to another device in a single, you know, fairly confined uh, RF chamber. Uh, so, um, so it looks as though the, the issue two may actually call out that there are some tests that need to be done in a multiple timber environment. And the nice thing about that, as well as all these other things I mentioned, like 11AX and, you know, dual band throughput and things like that, is that the test bed that I already described supports all those already, right? You know, the PAL-6 is already supporting 11AX. We're already a multiple chamber environment. So we think we're in very good position for, um, for issue two as well. Yeah, and you may have already mentioned, Lee, but of course the PAL-6 supports Wi-Fi 6 as well. So, so that's another relevant uh, thing to consider for the next issue. Yep. Um, so the last thing we wanted to show you is um, just kind of really how easy it is, at least in this test bed, to, um, to, to switch and a test and run another one. So I'm going to hand this back to uh, Prachi so she can walk you through it. It takes very little time because it is so easy to do. Um, and we're going to uh, do the, um, uh, the airtime fairness test. We're going to start the airtime fairness test running, and I'll talk a little bit about airtime fairness um, as well. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. So basically, when we want to uh, switch the test from one to the other, uh, there is this uh, BBF test sequencer file. So in this script, you can see that there are all the tests present in the TR398. And when you flip this, uh, flip the state of uh, individual test from um, zero to one, you can disable one and enable the other. So as you saw previously, we ran a multiple station test. So if I just want to disable that and enable the airtime fairness test, I can just uh, change the state to one here and save the file and execute the execute the runme.sh script. And what will it do is it, it will call the sequencer file and it will run the airtime fairness. So like uh, this is the way how you, with a single change in a script, you can change the test case. And the other file which I want to uh, discuss is the parameters file. So this file has all your global parameters. It has all your that information, uh, it has all the IP addresses of the PALs and the attenuators you guys are going to use. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can modify the details here in this file. And one thing about this file is you have to set it just once, uh, once, once you set up your test bed initially, and then you don't have to change anything in this file. You can change the sequencer and just execute the runme.sh script to execute the test you want. So yeah, it is as simple as this. Yeah, do you want to add anything or? I didn't have any more to add that uh, we just wanted to show you how simple it is to really you know, make a change, run one test, run multiple tests. Um, and uh, the test we just ran was airtime fairness. We, we, we chose airtime fairness. Again, we do not have time to run the whole test for you, um, but we just wanted to show you how easy it is to start. But the reason we wanted to call out this one is that it also highlights some of the nice properties and it has to do with the question that was already asked actually um, of using the PALs to do these tests. We have a DUT again, same place. Um, we run a baseline test where we use uh, um, two PALs down here. Um, that are uh, at the same uh, RF distance from the DUT. We run traffic. And then um, we, um, we use the, uh, the different attenuator uh, to move one of those PALs, you know, quote unquote, move it further away. Or we can leave the attenuator the same and we can use the fact that the PAL is configurable to change it from say an AC device to an 11A device. So we move it or we turn it into a legacy device. And again, that's very simple to do with the PAL. And when we do that, um, we can, you know, uh, we get a bunch of, of data. Again, many, many tests are run. We were running traffic to two things. We're moving things, we're creating legacy things. We'll have a lot of data. We can pull all of that in and you can see, for example, that in this example of that test, you know, we, we ran our baseline test. Everything looked good, passed. We, we moved one of our stations 
so you can see station two's throughput goes down um, as expected. It's further away, um, and uh, and the 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 test passes based on the requirements from tier 398. Then we, we changed one of our stations into uh, an 11 a station. You can see that in this case, one of our stations got the lion's share of the throughput. The 11 a station did quite poorly. Uh, and that actually failed the, the, the requirements, the threshold, sorry, the, uh, the throughput limit passed, but that particular part of the test failed. So we, we had a bit of a failure there on the, on the legacy. So, and, and that may well be how the, how the AP is, is actually handling airtime fairness. So um, just shows an example of, of an actual fail. Again, the whole test doesn't fail. I mean, the test, whole test does fail, um, but, but not each subtest. Uh, and so you can see all that detail. So yeah, to wrap up, we're coming near the end. I uh, just wanted to, hopefully we gave people a good summary of what's going on in uh, the broadband forum in tier 388. And again, it is, as far as we know, the first industry approved performance uh, standard for Wi-Fi. Um, we have seen very robust adoption. We have a lot of uh, interest in this from our customer base. Uh, right now in the group, as I tried to show you um, the Broadband Forum Group is working on updating the specification to include newer technologies and expand the reach a bit for uh, different topologies of deployment. Um, and the pass-fail results are sort of under constant review to make sure that they are accurately reflecting um, what what products are, are able to do out there in the, in the real world. So uh, I guess uh, finally to wrap up, um, our... Uh, our uh, Next topic uh, that we're planning to do is to discuss antennas in the test bed and um, various things like multi-user MIMO. This may be a, a, a topic that is interest to the person who asked about near field effects and things like that. Um, and again, if anybody has other topics they would like us to cover, please feel free to reach out and let us know. With that, I think we are, we are done and uh, happy to answer other questions. We have a, a raised hand from Naveen. Yeah, Lee. So my question is, uh, I, I am, I, I, so there is no uh, test plan for an, uh, current measurement in TR398. But I, 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 we have seen a lot of requirements from different uh, uh, battery-oriented customers for WLAN chip. So any, any, uh, any plan for implementing the current measurements for them? Uh, okay, so you're talking about actually measuring, uh, like, uh, power draw, that sort of thing. Is that what you're, what you're talking about here? Yes, yes. By uh, wireless chip. Um, I think I, 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 I may hand this back to Fanny. It has come up uh, in our conversations in the past. Um, I, I don't know... Uh, I mean, oh, well, let me talk about it from a broadband forum point of view. No, from a broadband forum TR 398 point of view, at least it's not on the table right now. Of course, you know, anybody's welcome to join the group. Uh, and, uh, you know, that that is something that could be suggested or added, but it's not on the table from a broadband forum TR 398 point of view. Okay, I would just add that this does, uh, power draw it mostly applies to station devices. And TR-398 is, is targeting router AP devices and where power consumption is not critical. Uh, but it is an interesting test case. Uh, we are thinking about it. It's a good question. I got a couple questions here, actually three open questions, Lee, uh, in the Q&A. Uh, the first one from Mattia will be uh, the penetration performance test restored in the future. The penetration performance test? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. It sorry. doesn't look like we have it in the list. So I guess I, I'm, the way I'm interpreting the question is, will it be added, maybe? Penetration. Again, I, I, I think I just must be misunderstanding the question. Th these are the tests that are called out in issue one. I, I don't know of any tests that were removed. Yeah, so Mattia, please feel free to clarify or raise your hand and we'll let you speak. I have a question from David Herman um, in, a, okay, sorry, I just scrolled right past it. So the first one, there are two questions. Can I do the MU-MIMO test with only one PAL-6 
which simulates two MUMIMO Vs tests, for example. Maybe this is part of next Zoom session. You want to take that one firstly? I will take it. Uh, so I, I will admit that I, I jumped over this a little bit uh, when, when, I was, uh, when I was describing the elements, although uh, we do have, uh, I, I did fairly highlight these stay pals over here um, as, as TR388 elements. I just did not actually specifically call it out. So um, maybe it's something for the next session that we, we, we need to talk about, but the, the highest level answer to your question is this, the PAL sixes, although they can be operated as stations, uh, cannot at the moment be operated as uh, multi-user MIMO clients. So uh, we have these other devices in here called stay PALs. Uh, those are uh, also chipset based uh, PAL devices, but they're uh, very specifically station and sniffer devices. And they do support all the station functionality like multi-user MIMO and OFDMA and things like that. Uh, and so um, when we do the multi-user MIMO test, we actually use three of the stay pals that are located as part of this stay pal group. So it's this guy, uh, the device under test, talking to three different stay pals. That's how we do that test. And then the second part of David's question is, when will it be possible to configure Vista via GUI because with last update I got from May, the Vista feature is available, but only the API. So yeah. if you're not a programmer, it's really hard to get working. Maybe I can take that on the yeah, that, uh, that would be best. Uh, yeah, we will be. Ha we have a new release, uh, and uh, that's going to be available in a month. Uh, that yes allows you to configure Vistas via GUI. However, I would add that Vista. I mean, if you have, you can have 96 of them in a PAL 6 and it does get tedious. So scripting is an easier way to go from for a lot of these days. So. Okay, so let's see what else we have. We've got um, uh, Wojcicz Romek uh, asking, will tier 398 have new acceptance criteria for airtime fairness with OFDMA? Good question. Uh, right. I mean, right now, there's no, uh, at least issue two does not get into OFDMA testing yet. I mean, I think the answer to your question, if you're asking it generally, is yes, it should. Um, I just don't know what issue that will be. Um, you know, I think the industry is still trying to get its head around how to test OFDMA the best way. I think we, we've actually done a few tutorials uh, that touched on OFDMA testing as well. Um, and the TR398 group will, you know, need to, as a, as a consensus driven organization, it's need, going to need to figure out what the right way is of, of testing OFDMA. So uh, issue two, we'll talk about 11AX, but there's no specific OFDMA call out, right? So it's going to be things like throughput and multiple station, but all, although the existing tests except run with 11AX, um, so I think OFDMA won't be part of it yet. Okay, and Matthias clarifying his question about penetration, Lee, uh, he says it was in the draft but has been removed. So uh, he wants in, to know if you, are, if you guys plan to reinstate it. The draft for issue one or issue two? I'm guessing issue one, but... Uh, Okay. Um, yeah, he says issue one. For issue one, and this was the penetr Sorry, what was it called again? Uh, penetration test. Okay, I, I I will have to go back and look. I guess it's some of the older ones. I have not seen anything in issue two discussions about it. Um, but you know what? Con contact me offline. We can talk in you know directly, and um, I should probably know about it anyway. I, I'm not aware of it, and I haven't seen anything in issue two. All right, folks, I guess we're up uh, a little bit over time. Um, I think we got all the questions, but again, feel free to- I think we have one comment. more um, in our chat. Um, uh, it, it says, uh, as you said that the forum is working on dual band capability issue two, do we have any update on that? Uh, update in what in what sense? Uh, I, I, I don't think I can actually expose 
the details of what the group is proposing. Um, I don't, I'm pretty sure that's not, probably should not be allowed, but I, I think it's okay for me to say that in general, um, dual band throughput and bi-directional throughput are test cases, but I, uh, I, I don't think it would be right for me to disclose the details of what's being discussed until it's public. But if you're a member of the broadband forum, you can of course look at the, uh, at the drafts. All right. Okay. And well, thank you all for uh, joining us and for your questions. I see there may be one more. Uh, it says PAL 6 is also 6 gigahertz capable uh, for 6E uh, from Zishan. It's not. It's not. You will need uh, uh, to add a 6E PAL to your testbed, but that's not hard to do. Okay. Uh, so, folks, thank you very much. Again, uh, we're delighted that you've joined. We'll be doing two more sessions live today, uh, and uh, we will be posting a video. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>